Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the herd of the daughter of my people and my herd, I am black astonishment has taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Thank you, Daniel Moses. Appreciate the scripture this morning and Brother Philip doing a fine job as always in leading the prayer and I appreciate Brother Bobby's prayer this morning very much. And so good to see each and everyone here this Lord's Day morning. It's always a privilege and honor to worship God and to study His Holy Word. And we are thankful for each and every one in our presence today. As we read a moment ago in our lesson text in Jeremiah chapter 8, the prophet Jeremiah asked the question, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? There is a balm in Gilead is our topic today. There is a balm in Gilead. As we may know, the land of Gilead was on the east side of the Jordan River. Judah and Jerusalem was on the west side. And across the Jordan to the east was the land of Gilead. The land of Gilead was well known for the balsam that came out of the terebinth tree, known as the balm of Gilead. And thus there were many physicians located in the land of Gilead. Gilead was not far from Jerusalem, which was in Judah, and, of course, Judah. It was not far away. We see the lament of this godly man, this prophet, Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet. Thus, he wrote the book of Lamentations also, as well as the book of Jeremiah. And Lamentations, of course, means weeping. He was weeping over the condition of his people over their sins that they refused to repent of, their rebellious attitude, their disobedience, and the impending doom upon them. Jeremiah reminds us of our Lord and how he wept over the city of Jerusalem in Luke 19, verse 41. Jesus wept over his people who were in rejection of him, and thus salvation, because he loved them. In like manner, Jeremiah loved his people. He was concerned over them. In Lamentations 1.12, he asked the question, Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? In other words, don't you care? Do not you care? We could very well ask that question today to many people. Is it nothing to you? Do you not care what's going on in our land and in the church? Don't you care about the destruction of souls, the disobedience to God, and the things that are coming upon us because of it. We know that the people of Judah were not saved. As he said in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. The summer has already gone by. The harvest has passed. And still, this is a figure, of course, we are not saved. All this is past, but we are not saved. And so here is a remonstrance, a protest on the part of Jeremiah. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? The obvious answer was, indeed, there is a bomb in Gilead, and there is a physician there. There were many physicians, but yet God's people were not saved. As we look at Jeremiah's great question here in chapter 8 and verse 22, we know that the balm of Gilead was famous. 
It was well known. We remember in the story of the great young man, Joseph, when his brethren had put him into the pit, they saw an Ishmaelite caravan going down to Egypt. And one of the things that they were bearing was balm from Gilead, according to Genesis 37, verse 25. We know later in the book here in Jeremiah chapter 46 and verse 11, the balm of Gilead is mentioned. Go up into Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. As we said, the land of Gilead was not far from Jerusalem and Judah. And thus the people had access to Gilead. But the point here of Jeremiah's words is not physical healing and not physical balm and not physical physicians. The point is you have had many opportunities and you have had access to turn to God and be saved, but you have refused it. Whenever I study this lesson, it reminds me of Middle Tennessee. You know, in Middle Tennessee, we're blessed in many ways. And I know that there are many congregations that aren't what they used to be. But the restoration movement has been strong here in Middle Tennessee. We're in the Bible Belt, and sometimes I say we're on the buckle of the Bible Belt. We have so many congregations. We have access to so much preaching here. And yet many remain unsaved. We've even got unsaved people who claim to be members of the church. We have congregations that need to be asked this question. Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no position there? Why are you not saved? Why don't you turn back to God? We have meet people around, right around here in Mount Pleasant and Murray County that have heard the gospel many times. Some of these have never obeyed the gospel, and some of them need to come back to the Lord. They can turn on the radio and hear the gospel. They can go to gospel meetings. But often, as we well know, my friends, these are the people that you will never see at a gospel meeting. But what about us? Are we taking heed to the Word of God? Now, the Jordan River was not a wide river like the Mississippi River. It was more like the Duck River. And perhaps in places not even that wide, and maybe wider than others. I have not seen the Jordan from the north to south, the land of Israel, but I have seen the Jordan River. And the part that I saw does remind one somewhat of a river like the Duck River, as far as the width. It's not real wide. It's not something that the people would have a hard time getting across if they wanted to go over to the land of Gilead, or perhaps if someone from Gilead wanted to come over to the land of Judah. But the point here is symbolism. It's not literal. It's symbolic. What I, Jeremiah is saying is that you have had many opportunities, but you have spurred them. You are not saved. This was a very urgent message on the part of the prophet of God here because what was pending was Babylonian captivity for the people of Judah if they didn't repent. God had called them many times to turn back to him and to obey him. In Jeremiah 7 and verse 13, saith the Lord, and I speak unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. And I called ye, but ye answered not. Then down in verse 15, and I will cast you out of my sight as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. I'm going to cast you out of my sight because you didn't hearken to me. God had sent prophets to them, but they did not listen. They were stubborn. They turned to deaf ear. The idea again is that healing and spiritual healing, salvation is readily available and accessible, but you have not taken advantage of it. We know that spiritually speaking, we need to take advantage of the opportunity to come to God and to be saved. Isaiah, another prophet of God, said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Isn't it easy while we are healthy and of sound mind and body and able to go about and to hear the gospel 
And that sometimes we think, well, we're always going to have one more opportunity. We will always have one more opportunity. That's the devil's deception to make people think, well, you will always have another day that you can obey the Lord. But we may not have another day. Because one day, that last day is going to come for us on this earth. Is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews 9, verse 27. We remember that Paul told the Athenians on Mars Hill that the Lord is not far from every one of us, Acts 17, verse 27. His idea was not that in sin you're not far from God. That isn't what he was saying. He is saying, though, that God is accessible to you if you will turn to him. God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, he said in verse 30 later. God is accessible, and isn't that true for people? Even today, if we will turn to God. We know that the balm of Gilead was equal to the disease. God's remedy is a balm more powerful than the disease. It is able to cleanse us from our spiritual malady, which is sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6.23. But the blood of Christ is able to remove that sin. We read in Revelation 1.5 of him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. When a person obeys the gospel, that blood, that balm of Gilead, if you please, cleanses man of his sins. It washes the soul clean. As Ananias said to Saul, And now why tarest thou rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But if we're faithful, the blood continues to cleanse us. Some people are baptized and not long thereafter they become unfaithful. Maybe they have the attitude, well, I'm just going to go ahead and get it baptized and get it over with. They don't look at it as being born again. When a baby is born, that's not the end of life. That's the beginning. In life matter, when we're born again of water and the Spirit, John 3, verse 3, and verse 5, it begins a new life in Christ. We are to live for Christ from that time forth. We are to be faithful, and we know that if we love Jesus, keep his commandments, John 14, 15, and continue with him that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. But in order to receive the healing and cleansing of the blood of Christ, we have to follow the prescription that the great physician gives us. That prescription is the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, Romans 1, 16. We know that in the Bible, that the word believe, if it's true biblical faith, encompasses obedience. And that's the idea in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's not faith only there, as some people try to say. That's not mere mental asset assent rather that Jesus is the Son of God that is to obey the Son of God we will not perish but have everlasting life as we think about the great physician Jesus Christ we remember that and we have this account in Mark chapter 2 and also in Matthew chapter 9 how that the Lord called Matthew or Levi as he is also known to come and follow me to follow me, the Lord said, and Matthew did. Now, Matthew was sitting at the receipt of custom when the Lord called him. That is, he was a tax collector. And there he was at the place where taxes were collected. And we know that tax collectors or publicans were very unpopular. And when the scribes and the Pharisees, after Matthew began to follow Jesus, when they saw Jesus sitting and eating, at Matthew or Levi's house with the publicans and sinners, they, they questioned that. And they had something to say about it, but the Lord gave them an answer. In Mark 2, 17, he said, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The great physician is Jesus Christ. 
We know that when it comes to our personal doctor or physician, it's important to us, at least I think most people are like this, we want to have a doctor that we like. And one that we like is basically one who, number one, he knows what he's doing. But number two, he's one that shows that he cares. He cares about us. And if we have a doctor, he may be an expert. We may go to him simply because he knows what he's doing. But we really appreciate a physician that cares, that shows us concern over us, do we not? Well, we have both of this in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ knows and He cares. He is able and He is willing to be our great physician and to heal us and to save us. Isn't this a great thing? We know that the Lord is qualified. I've noticed in uh, going to the doctor through the years that many times you go in that little room and they finally call you back there and you sit on the table or the chair and a lot of times you see the doctor's diploma or his credentials on the wall. Have you noticed that? You know, I don't blame doctors for doing that. They spend lots of time and years of their life to gain those diplomas. But perhaps there's another reason for it. They want the people who go in there to see them to know that they've been well trained that they have been trained to do this work. We should know from the Bible that Jesus Christ is qualified to be our great physician. He was the very fulfillment of all the types and the prophecies of the coming Messiah, the Deliverer, that was prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. In Luke, the 24th chapter, this is after the Lord's resurrection and before his ascension back to heaven. In verse 44, and he said unto them, that is, his disciples, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of all these things. And thus he was and he is fully qualified to be our Savior and our physician. But moreover, he is a great physician who cares. He really cares. We do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Hebrews 4.15. In other words, he can be. And he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And thus we are to cast all of our care upon him, for he careth for you. 1 Peter 5.7. He is in the office of a healer. We know that he was likened unto the brazen serpent. This was typical of Jesus. When Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the people were bitten by fiery serpents, serpents, and they looked to that brazen serpent, that serpent of brass that Moses put up upon a pole, and when they looked, they were healed. And later on in John 3, Jesus tells of himself in that vein. And the point is that when man in sin looks to Christ, and of course looking there is the idea of looking to him in faith and obedience, that man will be saved, that he will be healed of his sins. In John chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, and, man, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. When we look to the great physician, Jesus Christ, the one who was predicted to arise with healing in his wings, the son of righteousness, Malachi 4.2, then we know that we are looking to one who can save us and who will save us. If we come to him, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out, Jesus said, John 6.37. And we know that whosoever will may come, and the spirit of the bride say, come, and let him that hears say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22, verse 17. We have a great physician who loves our souls. 
Christ didn't simply die for us because the Father made him against his own will. It was God's will that Jesus die on the cross. We remember this teaching. The Lord said, I'll come to do thy will, O God. In the garden he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. But yet the Lord out of his own love gave himself for us. The Father loved us, but so did the Son. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, Romans 5, 6. Paul speaks of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me in Galatians 2 in verse number 20. You know, one thing that Satan tries to get man to do is to disbelieve the love of God. This is how sometimes children and young people turn against their parents. They will listen to someone who will tell them, oh, your, your mother and daddy don't care about you. Just go and do what you want to. They're just telling you that because of this reason, that reason, the other reason. Like the parents don't really care. Maybe you heard a story about that girl in New Jersey this past week, a teenage girl who sued her own parents. She left home and sued them that she should get so much money out of them. Maybe you heard that. And the judge, he didn't have any time for that. He put that down in a hurry. It's a good thing he did. Uh, the things that girl said to her parents was vulgar, disrespectful, and crude and rude. And, you know, she had the wrong attitude. Well, the devil tries to stir us up against God like that, like God doesn't really care. Satan tried to make Eve believe, oh, well, God doesn't really care about you. He's just afraid you'll be like him. You'll have knowledge like he does. But you'll, when you, if you eat of this tree, that's the reason he doesn't want you to eat of it. And we know that she allowed the devil to deceive her, and she ate of that fruit. And sometimes people listen to the devil. Now, how does the devil work? He works through his children. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, Paul speaks of in Ephesians 2, too. So the things that we read that are worldly and ungodly and dark spiritually and the companions that feed us the wrong thing could even be educators. They persuade people against God and try to turn people against God in their attitude. That's why we have to be so very careful that what we listen to. But like Jesus, like a good physician, Jesus understands the malady from its start, its development to its end. In fact, he understands our problem even more than any earthly physician. Jesus Christ knows and he cares. He knows what is in man, and he knew what was in man, according to John 2, verse 24 and 25. The Lord knows how sin develops, and he is able to take that sin away. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And lust, when he hath conceived, bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death, according to James 1, verse 14 and 15. As the divine Son of God, He is all-knowing. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Almighty, Revelation 1.18. He is the one whose eyes are as a flame of fire, Revelation 1.14. Piercing, all-knowing. He said to every one of those congregations in ancient Asia Minor, I know thy works, for example, to Ephesus, Revelation 2, verse 2, and to all the others. Have you ever thought about the fact that when Jesus was on earth, there was not a single disease that he could not heal? Not a one. In Matthew 4, verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. We read of him in Matthew, the 8th chapter, in verse 16 and 17, When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, all that were sick. 
that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. A reference to Isaiah chapter 53. We note that Jesus Christ was able to take away all of man's physical diseases. Infirmities is from the Greek word asthenia, and it may refer to physical or spiritual maladies or disease. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost who come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them, Hebrews 7.25. In like manner, he is able to save us from all sin. We read of the Colossians in chapter 2 and verse 13, who had been redeemed by the blood of Christ, according to Colossians 1.14 even the forgiveness of sins. The verse says, Paul said of them, having forgiven you all trespasses. All trespasses. That's what Christ and his blood can do. It can cleanse us and free us from all sin. Now as Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4 and 5, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. We know that it's by the stripes of the Lord that we are healed, Isaiah said. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. I might have left that out. And with his stripes we are healed. Read the observation that Brother Guy in Woods made on the word stripes here. And also, it's referred to in 1 Peter 2, 24, in his commentary on 1 Peter. Peter says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. The word stripes in the original is singular. Although in English, it comes across as plural. The idea apparently is that there was one stripe or wound covering his entire body. Bruised and swollen welt from which blood trickles, the livid mark on the quivering flesh, red and raw from scourging. His body was so bruised that it was but one wound or stripe covering the entire body. Isn't that amazing? That's what the Lord went through for us. Well, tonight, the Lord willing, I want to continue with this lesson. Well, this morning we're going to close on this. There's a song that uh, we've heard through the years. Um, I don't think it's sung very much, but it, the words are beautiful. There is a bomb in Gilead. You know, there is a bomb in Gilead. In other words, there is cleansing and salvation for those who would receive it. We should be thankful, even this morning, if we are cleansed already. We may not be one who needs to come to the Lord, but shouldn't we be thankful for that great sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us? Surely here we're going to remember his body and blood. You know, you can tell the people in the church who really appreciate what the Lord has done. They're the ones who are faithful. They are the ones who are obedient to the Lord. They are the ones who go out and try to tell others about the bomb of Gilead and the great physician Jesus Christ. They are the ones who want to bring others to follow the prescription of salvation, the gospel. People that don't really appreciate the Lord and his salvation, they don't do that. They're not that interested. They may want to appear that way. But when Christ is one that we truly love and we appreciate what he has done with all of our being, we cannot but help tell people about him. We cannot help it. You know, I read a story about an alcoholic one time. He said the only way that he could stay away from alcohol was to go around warning other people about it. Well, there's a good point to that story, wasn't it? You know, friends, the only way we can really be faithful to the Lord is if we obey His commands every day, certainly. But we also need to be urgent in trying to bring others to Him. 
If we're not interested in our fellow man and his soul, are we really faithful? Are we going to be faithful if we don't care about the souls of others? The wise man said, He that wins souls is wise, Proverbs 11, 30. And we need to be like the early church. And they actually did. They went around all the time telling people about Christ. In Acts 8, 4, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, if we'll do that, if we'll go around telling others of Christ and trying to bring others to Him, we'll find that we're praying more, that we'll be studying more, that we'll be more faithful, that we'll be obedient. You know, one of the worst things that can happen, well, in one sense it is anyway, is if you invite somebody to come to services and they show up and you're not there. That is for reasons other than being sick. That happens sometimes. That has happened. And that person wonder, well, I thought that so-and-so was a member here. Well, are they here? Well, they just don't come, but, you know, one time a week. Friends, we need to think about that. Tonight, if we have any here who need to come, or today, and obey the gospel, we must come to the Lord in faith. Hebrews 11 and 6, repent, Acts 2, 38. Confess Jesus Christ, Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And have our sins washed away. Be baptized for remission of sins. Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16. If we have done that, but we realize that we are like the people of Judah, we become unfaithful to the Lord. We become disobedient. We've lost our appreciation for our great physician and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We realize that we, like the people of Judah, and this is one of the great dangers in the church, my friends, and it is a problem. We take things for granted. We have so many blessings. Do you know one thing that will make you wake up is if you lose that blessing. Sadly, some people are going to wake up. It's going to be too late. They're going to wake up in eternity, so to speak, and they have not been faithful to the Lord, or they have not obeyed the gospel. And then they will think about all those opportunities they have. They will wish they could now cross over Jordan River and get into Gilead and find a physician. Now what I'm talking about is find the great physician, Jesus Christ, and have the balm of Gilead, the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Christ applied. If you need to come back today and repent and pray God's forgiveness for coming and obey the gospel, we invite you while we stand and we sing.